So now we're going to look at the patristic age. And again, this is from around 100 AD uh, to 600. And this is, this is the sort of uh, a, a large time period that's from the end of the apostolic time period or the early writings of the, of the Christian church all the way through what's typically the fall of the Roman Empire in the West and sort of the beginning of the degradation of pretty much thinking when it comes to doctrine and all that stuff. And we, we enter sort of in the Western Europe anyway, it's sort of the Dark Ages. Uh, there's, it's not totally dark, but it's from a theological development. As I've taught through church history, I always ask people and say, and when was the last time we heard the Bible? Well, this is the time period that there's still biblical stuff going on, but these schools start diverging and they start coming up and then it kind of dies away and we're going to see sort of allegory and traditional views are the dominant ones. So we're going to watch how this develops. So let's look at first off some of the early church fathers. And these, oh. these are the ones that would be uh, not the apologists or sort of the later ones, but these are the really, really early ones. And first one is a guy named Clement of Rome. And he was, uh, again, right during the time of Jesus and all the way through the life of John, around 30 to 90 AD. And he was a guy who quotes the Old Testament frequently, and he saw the Old Testament as a preparation for Christ. In other words, the Old Testament points to Christ. Now, I have to be very careful about what I'm saying right now. Is These early guys, we don't have a lot of, here's their hermeneutical system. We can only glean from what they wrote and how they wrote to see how they were thinking. And so Clement here is, is not allegorizing. He's sort of saying, here's what it says, here's what it's going, and here's it pointing to Christ. So it's a very Christocentric uh, viewpoint. So that's kind of interesting to see, right? Even when the apostles are writing this stuff, Clement is seeing exactly that. So that's a very informative understanding that this is how a lot of early guys saw what the New Testament was, uh, the Old Testament was pointing to. Um, we end up with a guy named Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, this is where, you know, Paul and Barnabas were. And again, same time period, 35 to 107. So we, we see some of his writings and he wrote seven letters to Rome and he made many allusions to the Old Testament. And again, his approach was very Christocentric. Uh, he avoided allegory. So this, again, is sort of telling. The early guys were not trying to allegorize. They were saying, here's what the word says. And flowing from the Old Testament into the New. Uh, Polycarp of Smyrna. And um, he was from 70 to 155. Now, Polycarp is a famous martyr. So if you go to the church history lectures, you'll actually hear about Polycarp. And his faithfulness. I mean, the guy was martyred like at 86 or something like that. And he quotes from both the Old Testament and New Testament. And so he's not trying to interpret it in weird ways. He's saying, okay, here's what's going on. Here's what the scriptures say. Here's what's going on. Here's what the scriptures say. And he wrote a bunch of letters to the Philippians and things like that. Again, we don't know what his interpretive process was, but we can see how he used the scriptures. Um, then we have Barnabas. Now, this is not the Barnabas of Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, he writes um, on the, what's quote, unquote, quote, the epistle of Barnabas, and he has 119 Old Testament quotes, but he also allegorizes. So you see some of that, that Jewish allegorism into, into the Christian stuff. So you see mostly sort of a Christocentric, more literal, but you also see elements of allegorism that get dumped in there. Question? A question. You question. Really yeah. stimulated my thinking. Do you think the earlier guys, like Clement, Ignatius, maybe even Polycarp, were more literal in their in the way they dealt with the scriptures because they're reading the letters that are coming from the apostles during that time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great question because they they probably are approaching it in a more literal way because they're reading it. Matter of fact, uh, John and Polycarp and some of these other guys we're overlapping some yeah. of these people, Clement. So when they are interpreting and reading and all, they're, they're not having to get fanciful because these are the letters from and the apostles and some of the apostles are actually there. And they're looking at how they have dealt with the old coming into the Exactly, world. how the old coming into the new. So it, this is why you can't tell specifically, but you do get an indication that they tended to be much more of a, the grammatical, historical, rhetorical school of thinking, though there is, of course, allegory. So that's why these guys are, they're not definitive, but they, they, they give you a good leaning of how, how you, to think about stuff. Okay, now we're going to move sort of to the apologists. And this is where Christianity is trying to defend itself 
both from Jews and Greeks and anybody else who thought, well, these guys are just a bunch of you know, crazy people running around. They're trying to defend their faith. That's what an apologist does. Here's my faith. There's also, again, in the church history, all sorts of crazy ideas like Christians eat babies and you know they worship a, a, a jackass and, and all sorts of, th it's really nuts. So the apologists actually had to defend from a lot of this stuff. So again, this is the context of what they're doing. And these apologists in the 100s to 200s time periods. So some of these guys became much more prone to allegory. And the reason they were is because they're dealing with Greeks and they're trying to reach to the Greek intelligentsia or those kinds of guys. So you got to talk with Greek philosophy, so you have to interact it in some way. And since when you're talking philosophy, they're ideas. So ideas come out in allegory easier, so they tended to do this. So the first guy is a guy named Justin Martyr, and this is from 100 to 164 roughly. Uh, he saw Christ in the Old Te Testament, but typically ignored much of the immediate context. So it's interesting. He sees Christ there, but he's kind of like, eh, I'm not paying any attention to the, the context of what's being written. He used allegory to defend Christians um, when he was opposing Marcion. And Marcion is, we talked about this back when we were, we were talking about the, the canonization of the scriptures. Marcion was the heretic, the guy who threw out all sorts of Jewish stuff, and he, he created his own canon. That's what caused the canonization. Well, uh, Justin Martyr was one of the guys who was arguing and debating with him. Um, now, here, here's something that, that has a flavor in a sense that you might go, okay, I get it, but he kind of pushes a little far. He says, Leah represents the Jews, i.e., quote-unquote, the law, Mount Sinai type of a thing. Uh, Rachel is the church, you know, the beloved one type of thing, the bride. And, and Jacob is Christ who serves both. And you're going... Okay, uh, I kind of understand sort of kind of what you're saying, but that's not what these texts are talking about. Amen. There may be truth in what you're saying, but, there, but there's no, the texts aren't going to tell you that. And so you, you see, he, he reaches, he starts trying to build these ideas and allegorizing things. Now, you get to another gentleman uh, named Irenaeus of Smyrna and Lyon. And he was in two different places. He was in Smyrna, which is the same place Polycarp was, and he ends up uh, in Lyon. And Irenaeus is, uh, there's a lot of renewed interest in his work nowadays. Um, he was from 130 to 202. He defends the faith of, uh, in his work, he defends the faith from fanciful interpretations of Gnostic teachers. Mm -hmm. And again, in church history, we have a whole thing on Gnosticism. But basically, this is the idea that there is this creator God, and there's these emanations, and there's this secret knowledge, and eventually you get this fail in the emanations who is the bad God who ends up being uh, the one who cr creates matter, and matter's evil, and spirit's good, and all sorts of crazy ideas like that. Um, that's who, what Marcion does. He picks up that type of stuff and some of the other Gnostic teachers. Well, Irenaeus is death on this kind of stuff. He really says, no, 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 no. So he emphasizes the natural sense and meaning of the words rather than allegory. He says, that's not what this stuff is saying. There's no secret knowledge here. There's no hidden allegory. There's the truth, and yes, it's profound and it's deep, etc., but this is the natural sense of what these words mean, and he, that he was a big defender of that. And some of, some of Irenaeus' work is quite interesting. He also used typology, instead of allegory to show the types that would flow between the Old and the New Testament. Now, sometimes that got pretty close to allegory, but he was kind of one of the early guys to help show how these worked using typology. Uh, he also accused uh, some of his opponents of two great failings, and here's what they say. Here's what he said. First, they neglected the order and context of biblical passages and instead took them in isolation and read preconceived ideas into them. Eisegesis. Now, we've talked about that this class, we're, we're talking about these hermeneutical principles we're going to be talking about are applicable to many conservative systems. However, preconceived ideas read into texts is eisegesis. 
No matter how good stuff is, we are all prone to that. And so sometimes systems themselves create preconceived ideas that the text must say that. Unfortunately, that gets really close to eisegetical interpretation, reading into instead of reading out, which we want to learn is exegesis, drawing out. So he, he accused them of trying to take these ideas and read into the scriptures. The second thing is they, in, they interpreted clear and obvious passages with passages which were more obscure in meaning. So essentially, they reverse the principles that we talk, we talk about is the clearer passage is going to help you understand the less clear passage. They would say, hey, here's this fuzzy thing. Let me, uh, here's what I think it says. Oh, by the way, that must mean that's what this text now says. And that's backwards. The clearer is going to help you interpret the foggier, not the other way around. And so he said, you guys, are, you guys are violating some pretty significant principles here. You're pulling things out of context, you're reading things into them from your preconceived notions, and you're taking the vaguer ideas, interpreting those, and then reinterpreting clear texts. So Irenaeus, like I said, he's, he's got some pretty good stuff. Then we come to Tertullian of Carthage. And again, 160 to 220, and Tertullian was, you know, famous in Trinitarian doctrine and things like that. Again, some lectures on him in church history. But he argues against the, the heretics, the Gnostics, because he's in the same time period dealing with Marcion and other people like that. And he says, you guys have no right to use the scriptures because you're abusing them, you're fanciful allegation, you're, you're just using them to suit your purpose. And again, these are the heretic Christians, the Marcion kind of guys. Um, and he says, the church is the interpreter of Scripture. And this was considered the rule of faith, if you will. The teachings have been passed down through the church. However, as nice as that sounds, this is going to give rise to Tertullian be the guy that everybody says, see, he says only the church can interpret the Scriptures. And you know where that's going to go. Eventually, Tertullian is now used as the guy to say, see the church, quote-unquote, and this point, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church at this time has nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church of later times. Um, we're the ones who interpret. And so he argues for the natural sense and the meaning of words, but he also results to allegorism if it suits his purpose. But he in, inadvertently, through his defense against heresy, sets up the argument which creates the traditional, hey, all these councils and what the church said, and say, he'll say, look, Tertullian said that. And he did, but it was a completely different context. So again, even the context of when something is being said is rather important to know and understand. Okay, so these are some of the early apologists some of the early defenders of Christianity. So now we're going to look at two schools, the Alexandrian school and the Antiochian school. And these are the two schools that sort of vie for influence and power, and they get a lot of politics. Again, go, go to the church history lectures. But these guys are two basic schools, and one of them is allegorical, and that's the Alexandrian school. We'll talk about some of their leading scholars. And the Antiochian school is much more of the grammatical, rhetorical, uh, historical ones. Now, both of them have good things to say. Both of them make some good points. And both of them can fall off the edge. Eventually, um, under Nestorius, the Antiochian school gets discredited because of some overstatements of literal stuff. So again, you can get yourself into trouble no matter what system you're using. So here's a couple of guys. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, not to be confused with the earlier Clement of Rome. This is Clement of Alexandria, 155 to 216. And Clement basically saw Greek philosophy was the preparation for the gospel. So some of the Greek thinking and ideas, uh, the idea of the unmoved mover, there is this something beyond type of an idea sort of saying, hey, you know, the Logos, the one who's the creator. So he sees a lot of that stuff, and John used some of that stuff in his writings. He sees this type of an idea that these bigger picture ideas are going to help the gospel. Now, yeah, they could, and they also could get you into trouble. However, he also taught that the scriptures speak in a mysterious language of symbols. Now, boy, can you get yourself into trouble when you start saying that it's a mysterious language of symbols. Symbology is part of Scripture, and symbols are used in Scripture. But 
the language of mysterious symbols really can get you off the beam fast. And he taught a passage, you know, this is each passage had five meanings. Five meanings. And he breaks it down this way. The historic or the, st the historical or the story, the doctrinal or the moral or theologic teaching, the prophetic using and types and prophecies, the philosophical, the allegory in natural objects and historical persons, and the mystical or the moral and spiritual truths. So basically he took what Philo was writing as the Jewish allegory guy he kind of looked at Philo's stuff and said, hmm, that looks good. And he brings this into Christianity. So again, this is that Clement allegory kind of stuff, and he's sort of the founder of that thinking. This is, again, where is he sitting? He's sitting in a, in a city that's cosmopolitan, international, lots of religions, and so he's trying to use Greek philosophy and allegory to bridge these gaps. He's well-intended, but whew, wow, go off the beam really fast. It's not like he's a heretic, doesn't believe in Jesus. You know, he just, his interpretive methods start wandering astray. Origin. Um, roughly the same time, 185 to 254, so he's a little bit later. He, Origen believes that the Bible was full of challenging parables, difficult sayings, and moral problems. Like, why do the apparent moral issues reside with the people, of God, people who are God's people? It's like, why do we sin? Because uh, we're still sinners. But he looked at it from a moral perspective and saying, well, if you're supposed to be like God and God's not like this, why are we like this? So ooh, this kind of makes them feel kind of squishy, if you will. And he says, therefore, there must be a deeper meaning. Well, where do you find the deeper meaning? In allegory, of course. And um, he also saw that there are some other problems with the scriptures. Now, Again, you have to understand how he's reading this. And this is kind of funny. We might, some people today might even read it this way. He said, you know, there's some problems here. There is no mountain high enough in which the devil could show Jesus all the world's kingdoms. So, see, clearly this couldn't be real. It's just a story. So he, he runs into these kinds of, you know, it's not like he's not thinking. He's just not necessarily asking the right question as to why is this being stated this way. And he also saw a threefold meaning in Scripture. It was the literal, moral, and the spiritual slash allegorical. Uh, pr in practice, he did emphasize the literal and spiritual, but he also believed that all Scripture has a spiritual meaning, though not all Scripture has a literal meaning. So in other words, his idea was the big spiritual ideas that were more important and some of the literal stuff, eh, not quite so important. So if you apply that to this mountain problem, he would say, oh, it's just the spiritual picture, a representation, because that's not actually literal. You know, and you, you do have to pause sometimes and go, hmm, I wonder what, how does that work? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that kind of stuff later. So Origen has this. So he, he, again, trying to preach Christ. He's very, very solid for the gospel, etc., but he kind of starts wandering off on things. So these are kind of the two of the early and principal Alexandrian fathers. Now, the Alexandrian school continues on for a long time, just like the Antiochian school. So we're just talking about some of the early guys. So the Antiochian school was founded by a gentleman named Lucian, and this is a little bit later. This is 240 to 312 uh, in the city of Antioch, and this is, you know, the city of Antioch. Paul and Silas send Paul out, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, they emphasize that grammatical, historical, rhetorical approach. And they also use typology instead of allegory to harmonize Old and New Testament. So they were also of that typology kind of people to help show types and shadows and, you know, bring, bring things together. And we're going to talk about typology later in the in later module or later lessons. Now, some of the early guys were uh, Diodorus of Tarsus, you know, Paul of Tarsus, Diodorus of Tarsus. Um, he used, again, more literal approach, including linguistic forms such as metaphor and parable, those types of things. And again, we're going to talk about that in looking at the scriptures. Uh, he was the teacher of uh, Theodore of Ma Masup. Bitia, whatever, I can never pronounce this one, and John Chrysostom. Okay, I can pronounce his name. These two guys followed on from him, uh, 350 to 428 and uh, 354 to 407. Now, Theodore, uh, or Theodora, uh, yeah, Theodore, 
uh, wrote actually against Origen. So if you think about this, Origen is the Alexandrian guy, and Theodore is the guy who's in the Antiochian school. He actually writes against, hey, Origen's not doing it right. This is not the proper way it should be done. We have to do it grammatical, liturgical, historical. Yeah, Theodore is a good guy. Yeah, we like him. Uh, because he argues this way. He says, if Adam is not really Adam, how did death enter the human race? Hmm. Great question. <laughs> if Adam isn't real, then how did the sin get here to man? has to be real. He can't be just some symbol. So again, um, he was probably one of the best exegetes of his time. Um, he, again, emphasized one of the things that's really cool about these guys, emphasized the historical background and context of the passage. He realized that the background of when it's written to the people it's written and the culture it's written and all those other things are going to help you understand how to understand it. Without that, you're kind of left hanging with words without a context. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of, you know, they want to make somebody look tall in a movie or a photo shoot. They put them on a white background and they set the camera angle, and then they put something else to make them look big, or they'll bring something in the foreground and they look tall. Well, you can make it look tall or small depending on the background that you place there. Without the background, you have no idea how big that person really is. No comparison, no structure. So he said that's really important. Um, John Chrysostom, um, his name was John, and Chrysostom means golden tongue. That's literally what Chrysostom means. So John Chrysostom was John the golden tongued because he was an incredibly eloquent preacher. Everybody thought this guy is just awesome. He was very passionate. He cared about the poor. Didn't make too much happy with some of the rulers who were kind of wealthy, but um, he, was a, he was a really uh, powerful preacher. And he has over 600 homilies or sermons, if you will, and it's expository discourse and with an application. So you see taking the text, expositing it, you know, exegeting it, expositing it, and putting application to it. And he was pretty good at that. And he was probably one of the early, one of the early of the early church fathers, probably one of the greatest commentators. He wrote tons and tons of good, solid commentary. And again, his commentary was a grammatical, historic, rhetorical, historical type of thing. And so that, that's these early ones. Uh, and in a minute, we're going to talk a little bit more about the late church fathers. In other words, the ones towards the end, heading towards the 600s.